Hello, folks, and welcome back to World War Two TV and what is the last part of South Asia or Southeast Asia as well week in a hastily put together show to replace one that ended up not happening. So uh, apologies. My preparation for this has been basically the last few hours. My guest is in Australia. I am in France. Time differences, getting information back together. But I hope you'll bear with us and, understand, and appreciate what we're trying to put together today for you. So um, my guest uh, is another sort of YouTube legend, really. Well, I'm not that I'm describing myself as a legend, but he definitely is from the Armored Carriers oh, website. Right. So um, good uh, evening, Jamie. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. So, um, you know, your specialty is is naval combat, particularly the, the, the carrier side of things in the Pacific Indian Ocean. Um, we're going to talk about that today and how it how it impacts on the war. And the first thing we're going to do, folks, kind of be a bit basic really talk about the pacific ocean and the indian ocean now this is dumbing things down a little bit but i i guess and i'm including myself in this we know more about the pacific ocean in terms of world war ii because that's the island hopping that's the you know that's the the, the movies are about that you know the movies at iwo jima the, 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 the indian ocean less well less talked about um and yet there was a lot going on there throughout the the, the, the years of conflict so so there's a nice map there of the Indian Ocean. So, Jamie, kind of run through basically the, the importance of the Indian Ocean to both sides in World War II. Oh, look, you know, I mean, there's a reason why World War II was called a world war. And I guess that is the Indian Ocean. Um, it links the new world with the old, with both of the main... Uh, Axis combatants in between. So you've got Japan up there in China, Malaysia, Indonesia, which is you know, back then the Dutch East Indies, and pushing all the way down to Australia. You had Italy and Germany you know, pushing down into um, Syria towards the Middle East. I mean, that, that was, that's where their pressure, the pressure was on in that area. So there was, and of course, the biggest front that everyone forgets about is, is, of course, India, where Japan committed its massive armies to try and steamroll through Burma and into into India. So it's just as strategically important as the Mediterranean, and just as important as you know, the Philippine Sea, but it doesn't have all the big. Um, Actions and the big events that uh, the other other locations have, but without the Indian Ocean, a lot of that wouldn't have happened. So, why is the Indian Ocean important? Well, first of all, when you start out in 1939, British Commonwealth is rushing to the aid of Great Britain. So, Australia is sending its divisions on troop ships, transports, supplies, equipment up to Ceylon, just south of India, the island there, and then across the Arabian Sea, up the Red Sea, through Egypt's um, Suez Canal, and into the Mediterranean, and on to Great Britain. Germany is trying to interdict that supply line. So you've got raiders in there. You've got uh, Graf Bay makes a visit. You've got um, ships such as the Cormoran and the Penguin, which are merchant ships with hidden guns all through them. Uh, submarines going in there, laying mines and, and torpedoing vessels. Again, it's a logistics war, trying to stop the supply of equipment from the greater empire to Great Britain. Then along comes Italy and messes things up. So that, by 1941, cuts off the Mediterranean. You have Britain's clinging on to Alexandria and Egypt. Gibraltar on the other side. So all that shipping has to divert via Madagascar around South Africa to get to Great Britain. And, but then of course, you know, uh, by 1942, you've got the whole fight going on in Malaysia. So you've got the British fleet trying to hold the line um, in the uh, Bay of Bengal against the Japanese, because of course, Singapore has fallen by now. And the next big threat is that the Japanese will push across and try and meet up with Germany in the Middle East. 
And that's what Winston Churchill's greatest fear is, is that those the two ax major Axis powers would actually form a corridor across the entire continent, the, the, the subcontinent. And what was the threat of that been, Jamie? Is it because, in a sense, German, the German Kriegsmarine, the Japanese Imperial Navy have kind of diff, different strengths that you put them together yes. becomes more formidable? And, and what would those strengths be? Well, it's, it's, it's the whole thing of, okay, if you get control of the Middle East, then both sides get an extra source of fuel, although in this time the Middle East wasn't as significant as it is now. Um, but they also just get the ability to transfer technology, knowledge, equipment, ma materials, um, not to mention that you know, Britain loses access to an awful lot of its resources in um, India and the Middle East as well. So um, the, the point is, is that Hitler was quite keen for that to happen. Japan was less so. And um, while, while the two of them bickered over what they would do, um, British intelligence was not exactly sure what was going on, and the British intelligence knew more what Hitler wanted and not so much what um, the Japanese wanted. So that they were aware that Hitler was wanting to push down towards the um, Arabian Sea in order to meet up with the um, the, the Japanese. Um, the, the other, you know, there's the big fear in 1942 um, after the fall of Malaysia was that Japan would seize Madagascar all the way over near Africa, um, simply because it's such a strategic position. If you own Madagascar, you can control um, the, the Cape around South Africa. So that would block Australia off from, you know, and India, from, from, from Great Britain. Everything would have to go around the other way, through the Panama Canal, via Argentina, um, a slower, more difficult process. So Britain actually invades Madagascar. Um, in 1942, you have a, lar um, a large Japanese carrier force goes into the Bay of Bengal and raids Ceylon and you know, sm smashes the British airfields there. Um, you almost had the very first carrier battle of World War II in April 1942, uh, just south of Ceylon, when the British fleet under Admiral Somerville with aircraft carriers uh, indomitable and formidable came within 150 miles miles of the coup de Bataille at night. It was it, it, nothing eventuated in the end, but it was Britain trying to do what it had designed its Navy to do, which was to fight carrier battles at night. People keep saying, why did they have biplanes? Why did they have such antiques? Well, the Swordfish and the Arbor Corps were not antiques. They were new aircraft based on an old design. Reason why they had biplanes was so they could fly at night and land at aircraft, on aircraft carriers at night and in bad weather. And that was the British strategy. They were wanted to fight enemy hostile carriers at night or in bad weather because they'd learned through their war games that whoever gets the first strike in usually wins. And World War II generally sort of backs it up. Coral Sea, you know, Midway, um, the first accurate strike generally decides the battle. So they thought, well, okay, we won't play according to the opp opposition's rules. We'll attack you at night. Problem was, they didn't uh, didn't quite manage to maintain um, contact with the Japanese fleet and um, ended up heading in opposite directions in the middle of the night. So you know, early April 1942 could have been Britain's Midway, but it wasn't. Um, and after that, pretty much it was just a holding campaign in the Indian Ocean for another year. Trying again, you know, with hindsight, we know Japan was focused heavily on um, the Solomon Islands and establishing its island chain in the Pacific. But in World War II itself, no one was really sure what Japan's next move was, uh, as we are, as we do now. So. They knew that it was pushing hard into um, Burma. So the concept of a major Japanese naval foray into the Indian Ocean was a perpetual risk. So they maintained a fleet at Ceylon to counteract that, you know, through 1942 and into 1943.
And is it fair to say, Jamie, that when we get to, you know, talking about the Solomon Islands and beyond that, is that mm -hmm. when we're talking about those, and I've covered some of that on my channel and the books, and is that if you're writing about the Solomon campaign, for example, and you want to reference the fact there are things happening in the Indian Ocean to kind of distract, confuse, keep forces over there, it's it's diluting the narrative of your own your own book because it's the rabbit hole thing, isn't it? How much contextual stuff do you put in to make Absolutely. your story work? Yeah. And of course, publishers are looking at word count, and, and I think that's yes. the difficulty. Is we tend, you know, we 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 divide it into what's happening in the Pacific Ocean, what's mm. happening in the Indian Ocean, what's happening in the Mediterranean, and in fact, all three are connected all the time. But trying to keep those plates spinning, if you're trying yes. to explain that story is very very difficult so you end up here okay i'm to hell with it i'm doing a book about the med and you do a book about the med mm. or the or the pacific or the indian ocean um so th this is why a show like this is 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 important to kind of bring a little bit of context to what's going on there um absolutely i mean it's look it's, it's only natural it was a world war so there's a lot going on all the time and what and they were always well not always but they were often in, interconnected so um Britain became quite active in uh, the Bay of Bengal in 1944 because it had managed to defeat the Italians in the Mediterranean. So its aircraft carriers no longer had to try and fight supplies through to Malta. It could spare them. Germany basically only had a couple of warships left bottled up in uh, Norway. So it could spare more warships from the home fleet and the North Atlantic fleet. So these were assembled in the Bay of Bengal. There they had to undergo a rather rapid, um, shall we say, training program or practice program to learn how to fight a different kind of war because the war in the Pacific is very, very different to the war in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean, it's a, it's a big bottle. So wherever you go, you, you're surrounded by land. You can't really run far. It's rather hard to stay hidden and you're pretty much always going to be within range of land-based bombers and land-based fighters so the big thing about the feel a bit about carriers operating in the pacific is you could dash your carrier in launch a strike then dash your carrier out of range pretty quickly couldn't really do that in the mediterranean so it was because it was also short range you know that's how britain designed its fighting tactics for when you move over to the, to the indian ocean you had to adapt those tactics it needed to suddenly discover how, or suddenly relearn how to do things like underway replenishment to top up its ships with fuel and ammunition at sea while moving from point A to point B. Something they weren't very good at. At the same time, though, they'd also lost a lot of their good, fast tankers and good, fast transports. These had been used to try and keep Malta alive, and a lot of them had been lost. These had also been used to rush supplies up to Russia via Norway. A lot of them had been lost. They'd also been used in the North Atlantic to keep Britain alive while Britain was being bombed, and a lot of the good ones have been lost. So by this stage of the war, Britain's having to do with leftovers in many ways. And that, um, that symbolises 42 and to a lesser extent 43 generally. We've, yes. we've talked about that in the Battle Atlantic week and what have you, is that the British so under-resourced around the world, as you say, we, you're emphasising a world war that to put more resources behind the, the arctic convoys or in the med you've got to take them away from somewhere else by the mm -hmm. latter stage of the war the us particularly have got enough resources to kind of well we can actually do two or three things at the same time now and the yes. british kind of get to that point as well but 42 43 is is so much you know um borrowing from peter to pay paul it's all that side of things and mm -hmm. and and as i keep saying for those who've been watching me a lot recently I'm beginning to find that 42 is my most in new, my interesting year of it the is. war now. I've been a 44 guy for all of my life because <laughs> I live in Normandy, for Christ's sake. But now yes. going back to 42, realizing how pivotal, how on a knife yes. edge so many things were. And of course, I knew about the big ones like Malta and Stalingrad and what have you. But now I'm realizing the real complication there. But in fact, today, Jamie, we're going to kind of focus on the 44, 45, because there's only so much we can cover. And by the way, folks, Jamie may not mention it himself, but if you want to explore these events in much greater detail, then Jamie's YouTube channel and his website will, will, will is like a spider's web. Everything we talk about today for five minutes 
he will talk about on his channel for two hours, three uh, three hours with videos and information there. So this is very much a starting point. If you happen to be watching this and you know your naval history in the Indian Ocean, you will maybe find today's show a little bit um, entry level for you. But that's also to cope with the fact it has to be entry level for me because I'm not an Indian Ocean expert. But hopefully it will, people will find something rewarding. So um, we'll bring it up to 44. Let's talk about Operation Diplomat, Jamie. Oh, no, so, let's talk. Let's you talk about Operation yeah. Diplomat. So, how many people know that the carrier USS Saratoga operated in the Indian Ocean with the British Eastern Fleet? I would guess not many. This was actually a return of the favour. In 1943, Britain had sent HMS Victorious to the Pacific when Saratoga was the only major operational carrier while everything else is getting repaired to help them out in the um, Solomon Islands and also to teach the Americans how to uh, use radar got radar fighter control to intercept incoming aircraft because Victorious was state-of-the-art equipment for that and also just survived the whole Malta convoy pe operation pedestal and was really top of the game worldwide when it came to intercepting incoming aircraft. Saratoga returned the favour a year later, by coming out to the Indian Ocean to help HMS Illustrious and the Royal Navy learn how to fight in the Pacific. This is about the need, this is about operations of coordinating your your um, escort screen and your battleships, and about the, you know the, the techniques and the needs for um, replenishment at sea, and also just to help familiarise the British with how the Americans did things because. The idea was that in a year's time, they would be helping America fight Japan. And that that's what happened, of course. So well, Saratoga... Is this, is this and, worth, I'm sorry to jump in here, James. Is this, yep. this, this sharing of experiences between the British and Americans, as you said there, British and the Mediterranean, is that, in a sense, exactly what we didn't want the Germans and the Japanese to do, to come together and share their experiences. Because it's not yeah. just their technology, it's their, yeah. the Germans say, look, this is how we handle things in the Med. Maybe you can use this when you're thinking about what's going on, I don't know, in Indonesia or something. Yeah. And the Japanese say, look, here's how we've been doing this here. Maybe. So so the, the Allies are, are doing exactly what we fear the Japanese and Germans might be doing. And it's, a, it's come up actually previously on World War II TV that we, we must be grateful that although the Germans and the Japanese are part of the Axis, they don't really coordinate very much on, in anything with regards to World War II. Not ground forces, not air, not not navy, not codes, not intelligence. I mean, there's some kind of cursory. Um, there, there is a bit. So, so they, I mean, G um, Germany does manage to send some of its larger submarines through the Indian Ocean into Japan, Japanese waters. You know, and those submarines are packed full of things like prototypes or examples of their weaponry and their equipment and their sensors and their radars that uh, um, uh, Japan can reverse engineer. And there's the submarines also come back carrying rare minerals and the likes that Germany needs. Um, but it happens on a very, very small scale. Yeah. You know, we're talking a handful of submarines, a handful of experts, whereas here we're talking about USS Saratoga, one of um, America's biggest carriers, and it's an uh, escorting force of um, destroyers working with um, the British Eastern Fleet. At this stage, it was only illustrious, but other carriers were coming here all the time. Um, HMS Queen Elizabeth battleship, HMS Valiant battleship. The French Richelieu was here as part of this force. Um, Renown, the anti-aircraft battle cruiser, and you know a whole lot of British cruisers and destroyers. So. It wasn't a small force, but it had had to learn a new way of doing things, and that's what the Americans were doing. Because you know, it was it helps America just as much to get Britain up to speed as it helped yeah. Britain to get America up to speed. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's what allies do. It's but it's often it do, often doesn't suit um, very sort of uh, flag waving narratives or movies or you know um, novels. To, to focus on events like this. No, I mean, the, the, yeah, I totally agree with that. There was a book, actually, the blurb for it a couple of years ago, Divided on D-Day or something about all the problems in the command between R Ramsey, this and that. And you go, okay, that, um, there's, there's lots of truth in what you're saying there, but why not do a book celebrating how well 
the the inter allied cooperation was because I guess a book about arguments theoretically <laughs> sells better than a book about cooperation. Yes. And you know, well, the, if you want to know how if you want to know how bad things can go, you go right back to 1941-42 when Britain, the United States, and the Dutch and Australia tried to form the ABDA defense of Malaysia. Um, very, very spur of the moment, very, um, you know, thrown together and it fell apart because no one had any idea how each other worked. So this, that, that nightmare is why stuff like this was happening now, to try and avoid that confusion, that lack of understanding, that lack of anticipation about what your allies will do in, in a certain circumstance. Um, so, and that's why even now we have so many multinational military exercises. It's not just about the radios, it's not just about the bullets, it's about understanding how your friends think and operate. It's so attitudes and doctrine and, and traditions right. even. I mean, we've got, we've, mm. we've got Kate Jameson coming on next month talking about all the traditions of the Royal Navy, mm -hmm. all the language, because... You know, a, a friend of mine who was a gunny, gunny sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps had to go for a familiarization exercise in Afghanistan where a British officer basically s told them all this kind of slang they're going to hear on the ground if they're working yeah. alongside British Royal Marines. He said, of all the things I learned there, that was one of the most valuable because when you're going in under fire in Kandahar, wherever it was, and someone shouting something across to you in the heat of the moment, if you don't understand what that means lives yes. get lost now that's mm -hmm. a very small level but the same thing absolutely equally applies and you know when i'm reading about i've done a lot recently about new guinea and and, and kokoda and also there is a distinct lack of each country understanding how the other ones work in that sort of 41 42 period that we you can see absolutely the improvements by the time you get to 43 45 and by 45 it's really quite streamlined generally across the board, how we, we understand how they work, they understand how we work, and that works for, across the board. And so, so yeah. Just, just as an example of how something like that could cost lives, when you're landing on a British aircraft carrier, if the batsman what lifts his arms like this, he's saying, go higher. Whereas if you're landing on a US carrier, he's saying, you're too high. Ah, so these are the <laughs> these are the things that they had to understand. That's a, that's a lesson you're going to learn the hard way. Once <laughs> after, yeah, well, if, if you survive. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or the people watching will unfortunately learn the lesson there once the hard yes. way. Yeah, and but, that's you know, other, lessons, other lessons were equally important. So you know, uh, the first night that uh, HMS um, Illustrious was alongside of Saratoga, and I think you've got a picture there of her in Trincomalee. Um, the Fleet Air Arm invited the Saratoga's um, uh, pilots over for a party, and they all got completely and utterly wasted in the British wet wardroom, drinking gin and rum and and the likes. Um, you know, with pilots trying to swim back to their ship afterwards while it's still heavily inebriated. So it was apparently a party of Ole of Olympic proportions, um, which uh, the the United States could only really try and uh, return the favour by offering ice cream when the British um, pilots and uh, their crew went to, to visit in turn. So, again, cultures on board ships. Yeah. Um, it, the differences there actually helped. Like, it helped break the ice. You went to a US carrier, you got ice cream. You went to a British carrier, you got blues. Uh, and there are all sorts of funny stories about, um, you know, pilots, uh, US pilots ditching and... Uh, cursing and swearing about being picked up by a US destroyer and not a British destroyer, because if they got picked up by a British destroyer, they'd get booze. And that was the whole point of ditching in the first place. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so so this is all good stuff. So so Operation Diplomat, so on the one hand, it's about, as you say, introducing American carrier to a British fleet cooperation, understanding each other's tactics, blah, 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 blah. blah. But what's its strategic um, um, reasoning? Okay, so the first operation under Diplomat is, is called Operation Cockpit. So this is where HMS Illustrious and HMS, uh, sorry, USS Saratoga attack, um, I think it's um, Sabang, and then the very northern tip of Sumatra. So if you look at the global map there, you see that's the 
entrance to the Malacca Strait, which takes you right down to Singapore. That's, a, that's the main choke point. Most of your big ships that are going to come from the South China Sea and the Pacific into the Indian Ocean will probably have to go through there or maybe a bit further down um, in Sunda Strait, which you've probably heard about USS Houston and HMAS Perth. So it was a raid on you know, port and airfield and surveillance facilities there. Now, it wasn't a minor raid because there's a very real chance that it could bump into a large part of the Japanese fleet. Because in Singapore, you've got carriers, you've got battleships, you've got heavy cruisers and destroyers. And they could go either way easily. They could, again, with hindsight, we know they had most of their attention focused on um, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, uh, and so forth. But at the time, Japan was trying to take over Burma and um, India. Mm. So it could easily have come up that way to support those operations. Um, and, of course, if the fleet had been detected coming to this location, they could have sought heed in response. So it was not by any means a minor operation or um, a, 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 not a, a non-risky operation. And the reason why it was conducted was as a diversion to distract the Japanese from operations that are going on in the Pacific, but also to, to maintain in the Japanese minds that, well, not everything's going happening in that, that, uh, that sort of Solomon Island, island hopping campaign. They could just as easily come up through this, through the back door, through Malaysia, through Indonesia. So this is the British, this is the, this is the um, Pacific equivalent of using Italy as the soft underbelly, I suppose. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, th th Jamie, as, a, as, a, as an unashamed ground, ground guy, mm -hmm. I understand this kind of thing perfectly because we get that east flank, west flank thing in land battles all the time. We get that move holding one force over there while another force over there does the movement. That that standard ground. But I don't think people like me get that sense. I mean, the great Dominion who's watching just made the point that some of these were diversionary raids, which is exactly what you're yes. saying. So again, when I'm reading about things happening in the Solomon Islands, I don't know that I'm getting the idea from those books that there are these things happening over here that's causing the Japanese to to worry about splitting themselves. And again, we must emphasize again, we talked about JWIC, yes, the Operation JWIC. Singapore is the gateway both directions, is it? You know, Indian Ocean mm -hmm. one way, Pacific Ocean another way. Such a um, prestigious um, uh, 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 objective, you know, or, or, or mm -hmm. for the Japanese, it's symbolic, it's the propaganda, for, hence mm -hmm. why JWIC was supposed to be a propaganda exercise. It wasn't so much about blowing up ships in the, in the harbor, it was about the fact we Australian special forces can go wherever you, you don't know where we're going to appear, wherever you are yes. across the Pacific Indian, we can strike you in your, in your most defended place that you think is, is safe and secure. And mm -hmm. so the, all of these things connect. And that's the thing the, the, the special raids connect the, the things in the Solomon lines connect the Pacific campaign, the iron hopping, and this connects here. And I'm glad you're connecting the dots on that. So, um, so you know, if, if just imagine you're the Admiral sitting in Singapore, which is, you know, just a little bit to the right of that map, and you hear of a raid on one of your nearby bastions, which is basically what this was, you know, by 50, 60, 70 aircraft from two aircraft carriers. That plasters the airfield, destroys 20 aircraft on the ground, destroys a bunch, sinks a bunch of ships in the, in the port, damages the port, um, and your counterattack launch is you know chewed up by its air defense the, the the forces air defenses you're thinking shit what's next you know maybe next time they'll push past into the malacca strait and raid singapore itself or you know maybe they'll they might go after the major oil fields a bit further down the coast so perhaps we won't send this squadron of heavy cruisers over to help um in the solomon islands because we just we need to keep those oil fields producing we need to keep singapore safe and these, these are the pressures you have to maintain um whether it's a land front whether it's an air front or whether it's a sea front 
Yeah, no, it makes sense. And, and, and the Japanese, we must remind ourselves, have spread themselves over an incredibly wide area by this point with this logistical problem of getting oil and fuel and rubber and all the other things they need to, su to support and maintain this massive great front. And if they're worried... Yeah, because we look at the island hopping campaign particularly, and it keep, it seems kind of logical. We've got it. Well, this one therefore will lead to that one, and that one leads to that one. There's not so much surprise. I know towards the end in forty five, you get the two routes, the Philippine route and the other, and the island towards Japan itself. But mm -hmm. in this earlier stage, if we're keeping the Japanese second guessing all the time and and worried about pulling people away from one place because of yeah, doing to them exactly what the British have been experiencing in 42, essentially, this this mm. paying Peter to pay to Paul uh, uh, principle of, 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 of always struggling to know where to put your resources. Um, yeah, and but at the same time, it's an ideal opportunity for the British to practice and test some of their equipment. So that photo you've got there shows a Barracuda. Now, it's flying off from... Um, you know, the smoke in the background shows that this raid was a, was a success. It destroyed all the, the, the main targets. But one thing they learnt was that the Barracuda didn't really operate very well in hot, humid, um, equatorial climate. The engine was just not producing its full power. So instead of being able to carry a 2,000-pound bomb load, it could only basically go off with a thousand, thousand five hundred pounds. So, and, and its range was greatly reduced. Now, the Americans, of course, were flying off their Avenger aircraft, which could carry its full bomb load over its full range. So, it made the British realize that, well, if we're going to fight alongside the Americans, we're going to have to A, fix the Barracuda, and or B, use Avengers. So, it just so happened that escort carriers in the Indian Ocean that were covering the convoys had Avengers on board doing anti-submarine patrols. So at the end of this operation, the first thing that HMS Illustrious did when it got back to Ceylon was steal all the Avengers off of the escort carriers right. and, and transfer its crews into them because the Barracuda wasn't up to it at this point. And it's, again, it's an example of the, the pressures that Britain had been suffering, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. In the war up to this point, the Barracuda was not designed to fly with a Merlin engine. It was supposed to have a bigger, more powerful, more modern engine. But that engine was cancelled during the Battle of Britain because of the emergency to build fighters fast. You, they had to consolidate all of their efforts to keep Britain from falling. So they stripped back a lot of their development and production programs and one of the things to suffer was the engines that were to be used by the fleet air arm. Mm. So that's why the Barracuda was not as good as it could have been because it had to deal with the second best engine. And that became apparent when it was, it was, it was adequate in the colder climates. The engine was working well there, but it just wasn't powerful enough where the air pressure and the humidity affects combustion um, properties so this, this is now making area. perfect sense to me jamie because in my in my prep this morning my hastily put together mm. prep i had a f numerous windows open about operation diplomat and one mm -hmm. website regard told referred to it as a diversionary attack one mm. referred to it as a basically a large training operation and mm. one referred to it as a, a raids on the coast you go okay well, I, I guess it's all three, isn't it? I mean, that's it the is, point. Absolutely. But you have to give a label to it, and I can understand why. If you're going into subject like me as a as a virgin Indian Ocean, it's mm -hmm. confusing. If if the oper if the operation is getting three different titles and or three different reasons on three different websites, yes. So, well, what the hell is it then? You know, it's one all it is all a training. It's for the training is clearly the aspect of mm -hmm. understanding the limitations of the Barracuda. How can they improve on that? What can Americans do? That's the that's the training. Perhaps is the wrong word, mm -hmm. but um. Uh, experimentation, it's uh, experience, adapt, isn't it? it's, it's I gaining experience. It's gaining experience. Yeah, yeah. and you know, experience involves learning lessons the hard way, <laughs> because you, you don't really get to do that in, in war. You don't get to just go out and practice like you want to. You have, a, you haven't got time. B, you're putting yourself at risk. Yeah. So exactly. yeah, just, just, yeah. we've got that's, a question from the great yeah. dominion there, just that you may be able to answer. Did the engine problems mm -hmm. with the Barracuda also apply to other Merlin engine aircraft, such as the Seafire? Um, not so much the Seafire, but it did apply. 
Merlin Griffin, um, I think it was more the Griffin engine. So the Firefly, the Fairy fly, Firefly was also operating in this area and it also had similar problems, yes. So um, I think it's a, for whatever reason, the mechanics were really struggling to get the tuning right on those engines. So you'd send out a squadron or a flight of five or six or eight fireflies, and one would have 25% better performance than the other, and they couldn't figure out why. And it's uh, ultimately, they obviously they must have figured it out eventually, probably after the war. But in this particular event, they were really trying to figure out what the hell was going on going on it was worse with the barracuda because the barracuda had to carry a heavy bomb load the firefly was a strike fighter which you know it was basically the a wild weasel aircraft its was, mission was to go in and attack things like anti-aircraft guns and balloon facilities and uh, protect the incoming strike force so it didn't need to carry a heavy bomb load it just wanted to to be able to to fly as fast as it could as far as it could it couldn't do that. It did, couldn't do that, but that it didn't, didn't affect its mission as badly as it did the Barracuda. And so this, and this, this, thank you. And that, that mm. is also just this understanding of, because the British, the Royal Navy are using a, a quite a large variety of aircraft out there. They're going to be su more suited to certain types of operations, certain types of climate, times of day, whatever it would be. And the more, mm of these things raids you can do the more you're refining all of that information okay so actually for this type of thing we should use this mm. from short range or we should use this from longer range whatever it would be and it's you know you can you can only you can only do as you said so much on the in theory there's only so much blackboard yes. information you can do you've actually got to go out there and do it for real so, so, so for example that important in that in that in that progression no, no, no. so so, so for example um the british had a habit because they were running convoys of when an aircraft carrier was launching and recovering its aircraft, it would simply turn out of the formation away from all the other ships with one or two destroyers protecting it to take on its aircraft and to launch its aircraft. And it, the reason why they developed that tactic, as I said, they were mostly operating with merchant ships. Whereas the American um, captain of Saratoga thought, what the hell are you doing? Why are you doing this? The entire formation should be focused on protecting its key asset, the aircraft carrier. So if your aircraft carrier is going to turn into the wind to take on aircraft or to launch the aircraft, your battleship should be turning with you, your cruiser should be turning with you to protect you. And that's what they realized in this operation was that, oh, shit, yeah, you're right. Thank you very much, Saratoga. We hadn't thought of that yet. But, of course, that whole formation turning idea wouldn't work when you're running alongside when you're running with Operation Pedestal, for example, where you've got fast moving tankers and transports trying to get from Gibraltar to Malta as quickly as possible to avoid getting bombed or torpedoed. Mm. So the more they zigzag, gives the oppos opposition more time to find them and to more time to drop bombs on them. So well, it was a change. In reverse, in Amy, therefore, for mm. my limited understanding of the Battle Atlantic and Medicine, is the Americans were slower to get good at convoy work than the British. So it's the opposite yes. reason. That, yeah, that, as you said earlier, by meeting the fleets together, elements of the fleets together, it's the shared, look, we're quite good at doing this, but we're not very good at doing that. And yes. you're the opposite. Let's come together. So, so yeah, and as typical, we know, the Americans got much, much better. Oh, why didn't I think of that kind of thing? You know, see, oh, why didn't I think of that? It's so obvious, kind of yeah. thing that you only get with experience, and that's what these transfers are all about. Brilliant. So, Operation Transom, next one. So, um, so we've got the yes. map again. I mean, Saratoga was only visiting for a short time, so yeah, it got recalled to the Pacific, and they decided that on the way back they would do another major diversionary raid this time on the major port facilities at, um, I think it's Surabaya. I've just got to check my notes. Um, yeah. It, it, anyway, it's a major port down there. The, this is, as I mentioned earlier, there's another passage here, near here, um, that goes through to the Indian Ocean. It's, it's another one of those choke points, the Sunda Strait, where the Perth and Houston was sunk. Um, a few years earlier so and this is near the, the long the, the, Strait that we talked about in jaywick yesterday the yeah. same the same 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 area 
same sort of area, yes. Now, uh, for the British, this was important because it's a long way from Ceylon. You can't even see it on the globe map there. So they really had to, no choice but to get their underway replenishment right. Um, and, and in the end, they actually had to try and do a bit of a compromise. They sent some ships to the remote west coast of Australia to which, and just sat there for them to go and use as a sort of a mobile port facility. And again, yeah, it was a, the, the whole point was to attack airfields, and attack port facilities, scare the Japanese, and convince them that things could be happening in this area, therefore don't go any further. But the difference here was that they, the aircraft had to fly all the way across the um, islands of um, you know, Sumatra there, so the Barracuda couldn't make it. And as you can see from this picture, the poor old Avenger that had been um, uh, stolen from an escort carrier had simply had its um, HMS Illustrious registration number just spray painted on the engine cowling there because that's how hurried they were in getting these things on board ready to fly alongside of Saratoga. And you know, again, the whole point was to get them across the mountains and across that distance to hit that island, to hit that base um, on the other side, uh, you know, it's a couple of hundred kilometers away from. And what, and what size range? What 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 number of aircraft are we talking about approximately? Okay, so look, Saratoga is of course one of the biggest carriers of the war. So you know, she would have been from memory carrying about twenty or thirty um, Avengers, um, twenty or thirty um, Avengers, but she also carried a, a decent number of um, Hellcats as escort. Um, Illustrious is a much smaller ship in size because she was built in the late 1930s under the treaty era. And the idea with Illustrious was to build a heavily armored ship with an armored flight deck that could survive being bombed, whether it was in the middle of the Pacific or the middle, middle of the Indian Ocean or the middle of the Mediterranean, um, and still either fly aircraft or make it all the way back home to Britain to be repaired because it was so far away. Um, so she carried only about 50 aircraft as compared to Saratoga, which carried about 70. And she was carrying in this situation um, Avengers and uh, Corsairs. So, of course, this is when the British first started using the Corsair uh, aircraft, which hadn't entirely been rejected by the United States Navy, but the United States Navy had decided that the Hellcat was just so much easier to fly that wanted to standardize on that. So Britain said, well, we're desperate for a modern aircraft with decent range and um, carrying capability to operate in the Pacific. So we'll take your cast offs. They shaved a bit off the wingtips to make them fit in the hangars of the um, smaller carriers. Uh, they developed a curved landing approach so that the pilots could see over the, in the gap between the engine and the wing as they were coming into the aircraft carrier to land which was different to the American um, tendency to just fly in a straight line and, and try and land. They couldn't, couldn't see the deck. And that's what solved the problems of landing this beast called the Corsair. And um, in the end, um, the United States Navy decided that, well, actually, we want that Corsair's back. And that mm. caused some problems back in, in 1945, but, yeah, not at this point anyway. So. But and also, you know, so if I'm if I'm clarifying and recapping things here, so they they're still keeping attention away from what's going elsewhere. But also, these raids on fuel dumps, particularly because mm -hmm. there's a cumulative effect for the poor Jap. Well, I don't say the poor Japanese, but the Japanese mm -hmm. at this one, because by the time you get to 1945, the Japanese fuel problems are are major, as indeed yeah. are the Germans in everywhere. So. Yes. Is there sort of a delay effect in sen in a sense that every time in these raids are perhaps not discussed as much in the bigger picture, but we're knocking out X thousand gallons of fuel here, X thousand gallons of fuel there. It's all it's adding to a German problem, uh, so Japanese problem that is getting worse and worse and worse for them. So when they get to to the later part, when we're talking about mm. raids on oil dumps later on in the show, of course, as well, mm. but it's, it's just, in, it's cranking up the pressure on the Japanese generally because there's only so much fuel to go around and again as you said at the beginning, it all comes down to logistics and supply lines well absolutely the, again the, what we know now they didn't know then yeah so you'll, you'll often see commentary criticizing a lot of these raids as pointless um because the japanese 
fleet didn't sortie and fight them because US submarines were having a very powerful effect in taking down Japanese takers in the Philippine Sea uh, and the like. Well, they didn't know that at the time. Yeah. They didn't know how many tankers Japan had. And the other issue is that they weren't only supplying fuel to Japan. They were supplying fuel to Singapore and to the India Burma front. So yeah, a lot of the fuel supply to Japan was being choked by the submarines operating in the South China Sea, but not the fuel being supplied to the China India front lines, because because that was had to go over a shorter distance between these mm. islands and Singapore. So it, yes, with hindsight, it wasn't as significant as it might have been, but also there's a bigger picture going on here. This made it harder for the Japanese fleet in Singapore to sortie because it was struggling to get fuel for its aircraft as well as fuel for its ships. Yeah. Not so but much fuel for the bigger air. picture operations that have exactly. five or six yeah. small and sometimes delayed impacts are not as sexy as an operation that has a massive, great, sudden impact Hence, mm. why we talk about the dim, the dam busters, for example, all the time, because it seems that it seems I'm stressing the word seems to have this massive great effect immediately, and therefore, oh my God, look at what that did, and other raids that are chipping away here, chipping away there, chipping away there, don't have that sense of sexiness that that, that, that a single raid does. So I think this is what I'm learning today about the Indian Ocean is that you have to look at these in context you have to add them all together and say this one plus this one plus this one plus this one over a course of nine months ten months a year is having these cumulative effects on damaging the japanese war machine and keeping the japanese confused but that's very difficult to kind of put in a punchy headline for a book isn't it or title for a book absolutely and, and everyone always thinks in terms of knockout blows you know it's the king hit yeah gets gets the attention and before world war ii that's what everyone was planning for you know japan wanted to king hit the united states at pearl harbor yeah yeah so united states now so well i mean club runs are just basically after saratoga goes and if anyone's interested there's some fantastic color footage taken of the um british australian and french ships sailing past Saratoga to say goodbye on my website. You can find it there. And there's some black and white footage of those ships passing Saratoga. <laughs> I didn't have as good, as good a cameras in the um, yeah uh, in the British fleet at the time. Yes, we, didn't. But, uh, we, we, we had the Brox Brownies. They had the latest. <laughs> anyway, yeah, let's not get into the differences of kit. But yeah. So, so between Sorry. April and um, December 1944, more and more British carriers assemble in the Indian Ocean. And continue these raids on the everywhere from the Andaman Islands again on the you know the the entrance to Malacca and and, and down along various targets these were again mostly sort of just exercises to teach each carrier what to do and how to do it but you know they sometimes met opposition sometimes they didn't um, they always encountered something new so you know, um, when you're in at the doldrums, <laughs> mm -hmm. no wind, no wind, no waves, nothing. You've got your carrier going flat out at 30 knots, which is you know, uh, British carriers could generally do 30, 32 knots. Can you get your enough of your um, aircraft into the air to actually make a worthwhile attack? And once or twice, they discovered that no, they couldn't. They just had to, you know, find ways of using their catapults faster to get more aircraft into the air quick enough. These, these things these things went on you know over that period of time um hms formidable didn't turn up because she stripped a gearbox um but you know the fleet of four carriers was ended up being the core that was you know to go on to fight in the pacific so um, and just to be, be to be counterintuitive for a second jamie mm -hmm. uh, you know, four carriers you said there and you said they're not they're not always able to operate blah 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 and we, we and you said about the benefit of understanding with hindsight mm -hmm. is there any kind of argument now to say that those four carriers and the supporting ships could have been used somewhere else more effectively uh 
or is there really at that until until we start pushing towards Japan? Is there really nothing else that they could be doing? The Mediterranean is kind of over now. What, is there an argument somewhere? Well, I mean, I guess I guess you could say why waste your time in the Indian Ocean? Why not just send them straight into um, the Pacific? But then they'll be learning these lessons alongside the Americans or in among the Americans, where it could be dangerous to learn these lessons and against a more focused, more intense opposition, where the consequences of making a mistake could be more dramatic. It's, I mean, it's, again, it's not as though these were, expect, were, were expected to be quiet times yeah. um, because there was the potential for the Japanese to sort here from Singapore. But it was known that, of course, that the aircraft squadrons that were based in these areas the torpedo bombers the heavy bombers and the fighters were either veteran units that were getting rested um, damaged squadrons that were getting uh, rebuilt or training squadrons so that they knew that they were up I, I suppose in general second line except for when you went against say the air fuel or the the oil fuels which is where they had top-notch mm. squadrons to protect a very important asset so there's always an element of risk if they sent these four carriers into the Pacific to fight along the Americans in the Philippines, I imagine it would have just been confusing and difficult. Yeah. For, for and then, of course, going back, if I understand this correctly, we've then left the Indian Ocean uh, empty, and then who knows what the Japanese yeah. might have done something different there. It's we it's, it's the it's the Monday morning quarterbacking, the month the Sunday morning yeah. after the FA Cup final. Correct. You know we can now say why did the Germans keep three hundred thousand troops in Norway, for example? When we never went to Norway, mm. but if they hadn't had the troops in Norway, we might have gone to Norway because the troops weren't there. You, it, that's the yes. that, that's the paradoxical thing about keeping a force somewhere because of a reason take them away the reason reverses the reason of it, it so it, it just becomes um as i say counterintuitive and pointless to a certain extent because at the time they were there for a reason that was perceived uh in the context of the time and and they were and and yet they are still accomplishing these attacks on on airfields and, and oil oil uh, dumps and so it's it's having an effect guess, anyway it's it's if if they weren't there the japanese could have had the potential to push a force up into the bay of bengal interdict all the supplies going up to support the front line against the Japanese army uh, there and, uh, and in, uh, fighting there and in China, throw the allies into confusion. Yeah. And that might have caused forces to be diverted from the Pacific to... Yeah, you know, I mean, and that and that all connects, of course, what we did recently with the Stillwell Road and what's going on in Burma and supplies there, and you know, yeah. and, and 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 supplies were critical there for the ground forces, and so mm -hmm. you 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 change. It's that thing where the domino effect. You make a small change somewhere else, and yet five seven dominoes down the line, there's a big change that's happened because of that. So you know, it you can you can understand where this is going, but um. We'll move on because we're swiftly moving for the show. I'm really, I'm really enjoying this, Jamie. Thank you very much for, for, for holding my hand and walking me through an, a, an area I don't know about. But a Meridian, again, every one of these, I'm reminding you folks, these these are offshoots. All of these operations, mm. there's multi facets to them. We are giving you a very, very potted, swift yeah. um, version of it. But but this is 45 now. So run through so, the purposes so, 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 of January, January, 19, January 1945, the, the Indian Ocean fleets had enough practice now it's it's the carriers are working together they're using some, the, the new carrier operating techniques taught to them by the saratoga um and they're on their way to australia and they're thinking why waste the trip we're on our way to sydney but we might as well make use of the trip and the the, the decision was to attack the biggest oil facility in the um, East Indies there. And, you know, with four carriers, it's it's even British carriers, which are you know, 50, 60 aircraft each, it's, it's still a very significant force. Again, though this time they are going up against um, not necessarily elite, but should we say veteran squadrons defending these oil fields. Yeah. Um, and they're having to fly a long way over mountains to get there. So... You've got, and, and you've also got a hodgepodge of aircraft with a hodgepodge of capabilities. But you know, the thing is, is they they got the Dutch um, engineers and architects who worked at the oil fields. They had scale models of these oil fields built. 
so the pilots could just recognize every element of the oil fields, of the processing refineries um, at, at a glance for their targets. So they would spend hours just staring at these tabletop size models of these if, um, these tank farms and um, separation towers and pipelines and the likes. And, um, you know, the strike force was mainly event was was mainly avengers the sea fires didn't have enough range to get that far so they were held in reserve to just protect the fleet itself and corsairs and hellcats would provide the escort and fireflies would provide as i said before a kind of wild wild weasel close escort slash anti-aircraft slash balloon defense kind of operation so it was you know um we're talking you know, HMS Indomitable, HMS Illustrious, HMS Victorious, HMS Indefatigable. They each have their different quirks. So Indefatigable what didn't have hangers big enough to carry Corsairs, so that's why she carried Spitfires. Um, Indomitable carried um, Hellcats because they couldn't, she couldn't carry enough Corsairs to be worthwhile. All these kinds of configuration, all these kinds of um, stopgap measures, <laughs> yeah. causing a bit of you know a, a bit of a mix and match. But you know, in the, at the end of the day, they got the strike in. They got it up. They got it there on time. It was it wasn't a perfect surprise, but it was a near enough surprise, and they hit the target quite well. Um, surprises, you know, there, there's always a surprise. So, for example, the uh, the reason why the British chose this target to attack was that. A month or so earlier, um, U.S. bomber uh, super fortresses had actually got turned away from a high-level attack on this place because its anti-aircraft fire was so heavy. They didn't actually manage to get over the top of the facility to drop its bombs. Smaller aircraft could fly lower, get under the the box barrage, and into the target. So, it's, this is why you have naval aviation and not just strategic bombers. Um, yeah, and it was. Uh, you know, it was a fairly intense fight. Um, it, once again, lessons were learnt. Uh, you had all these excited fighter pilots who spotted Japanese fighters and just tore off after the fighters and got a bit of a tunnel vision as to shooting down Japanese fighters, which allowed other fighters to get past them and get among the Avengers and shoot down more Avengers than they probably should have. So they get back to the carriers, they all get shouted at, <laughs> you know, comms discipline, stay on, to, you know, keep your mission, remember what your job is. So the second attack, you know, they went back. This time, of course, they were fully prepared. The Japanese were fully prepared, put up a very strong resistance, but the fighters didn't go too far from the, from the bombers. And you know, they did just as good a job on the second half of the office, with you, which is the other side of the river there. Mm. So, yeah, all in all, it was not a knockout blow again, but it was a serious blow to the production of fuel for Singapore in particular, and it also sank their last remaining decent tanker that was in the harbour at the time. Mm. Um, so, again, it was an incremental um step towards choking japan but for the royal navy this is their very first combined massed air raid on a, on a target they'd done yes they'd done strikes against turpits in the fjords um they'd done strikes against toronto and the like but um this is the first time they'd got four carriers together and sent sending them over such a long distance and on such a large scale and again, I'm going to go down the slightly counterintuitive path again because I feel the need to. We talked, we had Ian W. Toll on recently, we had um, um, James Scott talking about the Philippines and Manila. We've talked about the firebombing of Tokyo, what have you. Uh, we, we're also going to talk about um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the atomic bomb at some point. Now, again, and Alan Sol David on his Okinawa show was reminding us all, me and the viewers, that Again, we now know how the tome, timeline goes when you get to the summer of 45. Mm -hmm. we, down, we now know that the, we, the, 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 the Americans dropped the two atomic bombs and eventually brought this, this end to the war. But at this time of the war, spring 45, 
the Allies don't even know if the atomic bombs are going to work. They don't even know if this technology is even viable. So this, and on top of this, on top of that, they'd also been suffering a lot of damage to aircraft carriers due to kamikazes. Yeah. So, so, so there was, yeah, there was, so, there, was a, there was a real perceived need to get as many carriers together to go against Japan as possible. And the, the point I was going to make, and hopefully you'll agree with me, is the the the, the inter-allied cooperation to attack Japan over land would have had to be at their A game because yes. the, the kamikaze threat, which we could do it. In fact, we are going to do a show about kamikazes at some point um, with um, the fellow whose name is completely sailed out of my head. Anyway, um, uh, th that gets worse and worse. The closer we get to the Japanese home islands, the worse and worse the defense gets. And so the, the, the Americans, the British, and we must not forget our other allies, Australia, the Dutch, blah, 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 all out there. We are going to be on our absolute A game to do that. Now, we, again, of course, we know that didn't happen. We didn't have to go over. We didn't have to, mm. you know, do mm. that. But this, this experience of attacking in force with, as you said there, aircraft carriers with different um, strengths and weaknesses, different types of aircraft. They've now practiced working alongside the U.S. Uh, fleet. This would, this experience would have been absolutely invaluable had we had to do that attack on Japan. So is, is that a fundamental takeaway? My viewers who are watching this mm -hmm. who don't know much about the Indian Ocean and the Pacific fleet there, a takeaway is, is that of this show is how important that practice was. Well, it's, it's basically the Royal Navy's equivalent of the Solomon Islands campaign. Yeah. Because if you think about the Solomon Islands, the United States Navy learned the hard way how to fight the Japanese. Yeah. By fighting the Japanese. So this is Britain doing a very similar thing. It's learning its own limits and it's learning Japan's strengths by fighting them. And you, it's it's not a, a textbook exercise. It's not a computer game exercise. It's not a tabletop board game. These are, they are having to do it for real in real time to the best they can and learning from each lesson, so each operation. And that's the major part of each of these operations. After each of these operations, everyone would get together and pick over it with a fine tooth comb. Mm. What did we do? What can we do better? What went wrong? What went right? Um, so things like Photo reconnaissance was a big lesson from these operations. The need to make sure that they had enough aircraft, and in the end, they got a whole squadron of Hellcats specifically dedicated to photo reconnaissance because they learned that they needed to find out within a matter of hours whether or not the raid had been successful, if they were going to have a chance of having a second strike. They couldn't wait for a long-distance strategic aircraft to fly over take photos, fly back, and then fly the results or transmit the results via Morse code to the fleet, which that would involve days. And by then, the opportunity is gone to, mm. to, to initiate a second up response, to initiate a follow-up response. These are the kinds of things they learned. You know, they also learned that they had to pay more attention to training Spitfire pilots and how to land their poor aircraft because during these operations, they just had too many pranks, which is not a good thing. Spitfires had a weak, um, weak landing gear, excellent interceptors in the air, better than any, better than a Hellcat, better than a Corsair in actually intercepting Japanese aircraft. But you try and land the thing, it's a ballerina. She sprains her ankle all the time. And that's what happened with the Boral Court the Spitfires. So by the time they get up to Okinawa to help the Japanese, to help the um, invasion there, the Spitfires are now much better because they've, adapted them and they've taught the pilots how to land these delicate babies on a on a steel flight deck so yeah you know it's so many, I'm also so many kind things of thinking, jamie that when we look at the eto and we look at uh, and I'm, I'm again kind of ground folk because that is what i do the attack into the, the attack into germany although it, there was some problems there was really the chance the opportunity for the allies to, to have their cup file in a sense and show what they had learned from the dark days of the BEF in 1940 in North Africa and get a chance to put it all together. And, and in a sense, Pacific. in the Pacific, because of the atomic bombs, all of this, they never really had their cup final. It kind of... Um, I, I suppose in many ways, yes. But, you know, I mean, 
do you want a cup final with that sort of death toll? Well, no, true. Uh, I, mean, yeah, I mean, of course. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm looking at it from the mili- from a military historian yeah, point of view. Yeah, I, 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 I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess the Americans had that sense with the battles of Leyte, you know, the Great Marianas Turkey shoot. The, those were the big knockout kind of blows that yeah. you want, and they got them. Um, so by the time they got to Japan, there was no real fleet left for a, a last stand. True. You know, Yamato was just a, a throwaway token tokenism. So yeah, I guess at sea America got that. I guess at the Philippines, MacArthur got what he wanted. He he got to land on the Philippines and say, "I have returned." But in Southeast Asia, you had a very large British Australian invasion force with lots of leftover landing ships from um, Normandy. Yep. All ready to go to invade, you know, um, the, the, the Dutch Southeast Indies. Um, they had light fleet carriers, escort carriers, French battleships, British battleships, all ready to support. And then the war ended. So you know, it wasn't just Operation Olympic, the invasion of Japan. That yeah, of course, didn't yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. There was a lot of lives saved from by the nuclear bombs down in Southeast Asia as well. So yeah, I can guarantee to you that every single one of them would have been cheering. No, oh and, yeah, no, I, 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 <laughs> no, no, I I'm not, not criticising you. Know. I'm just, but yes. um, and so you know, we'll, we'll bring the things into. But yeah, you know, some t- again, a couple of takeaways. You know, I mean, I'm, again, I'm urging people. People have already said in the sidebar, um, to check out your website there, and and and, and because I threw this show together, that mm. it, people would be finding it later because I couldn't publicise it too much in advance, and that's <laughs> my apologies for hastily putting it together, but. You know, for people who, who are watching this, I mean, there are people who are Ian Carr knows his stuff with regards to naval history, but others who don't. Some kind of a couple of kind of soundbite takeaways of things we who think of ourselves as students of the whole war, a couple of kind of mm-hmm. takeaways from the Indian Ocean that we should have in our heads at all time. A couple of I know we kind of covered that introduction, but anything to kind of sum up? Well, look, I mean, this we very much focused on the naval side of things here but you've got to remember that the, the fight in china and india and burma tied up a massive com- section of the imperial army so by holding that front in 1942 and 1943 and rolling that front back in 1944 and 45 kept a significant s- segment of japanese forces away from the Philippines, away from yeah. Japan. We, you know, the bulk of their army was here. And sure, the, the bulk of their navy didn't operate here. Um, but that's because of geography. It was just too dangerous to push things through those narrow channels, basically. Um, and also, frankly, the American navy was a bigger threat. Um, so you, you, you've just got to remember that in a world war, even a little place, a little place, a remote place like Madagascar is important because if Japan had seized Madagascar, it could operate submarines from Madagascar, it could operate raiding destroyers and raiding aircraft carriers from Madagascar. Those could sweep around South Africa. Those could sweep up to um, Egypt. They could basically choke Africa and Australia just by having them located in that part of the world. Mm. So the same thing if, if, if Ceylon had fallen, which is now Sri Lanka, of course, it's, it's another, it's, it's the equivalent of a Malta. Yeah. It's, another, it's another Singapore. It's, an operate, it's a forward operating base. It's a position where you can base your forces to interdict, to interfere and distract so by holding those those locations and staging from those locations and doing the same thing in in the other direction, interfering and distracting in all this time, then you, you, you've just you ma- you complicate things mm. for your uh, for Japan so much more, and when things are complicated, it's so much easier to make mistakes. Yep. And the, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. The, if they're if they're if they're spinning plates like we are, then that the, you're going to make you're going to drop one every now and then. You're going to make that mistake. That's and right. I think, you know, my closing remarks will be in 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 this in in commemoration of the the theme this week is is the contribution of people, the people themselves from South Asia, the people in the the, the, the Kachin 
uh, rebels in in, in so, you know in, in Burma than New Guinea. To, it's important um, to remember that there was large groups of Indians on board British battleships, um, yeah. officers, midshipmen, crew. Um, there were Canadians, New Zealanders um, in the um, fleet air arm, very large contingents of those. There were Australian destroyers, Australian cruisers, Australian exchange crew on board the ships. Um, it, was a, you know, it was a Commonwealth effort. And by the time you get to the Pacific, you know, these aircraft carriers all had American liaison and communications yeah. officers on board and, um, to help with the coordination. So, yeah, it was really very much the birth of the modern, you know, coalition. Yeah, kind of and, you know, and things like the Australian Coast Watchers and the information we'd have got about um, currents in channels, all from merchant seamen before the war and locals, because, you know... It, it, there's there's only so much, so many people in the U.S. Navy or British Royal Navy who had been to some of these places like Sumatra and Indonesia, and so without that local information from people who had been traveling them for generations, and yeah, you, know, you don't want to go down that thing at high, you know, when the current is going this way. All that information is absolutely invaluable, and I think that the importance of the, of the, the, the South Asian theater is is it needs to be needs to be increased. I think. And getting like that, getting people like that to build those models of those refineries, for example, massive yeah. makes a massive difference. If you're you've never, you know, none of these pilots would ever have been there before. You look at a black and white photograph. There's a few smudges and smears here and there. You might be told what's going on, but if you can actually sit there and stare at a tabletop size scale model of the entire thing for days on end, by the time you're actually flying over the top of it, you can pick out that particular hut. That you know is the pumping yeah. station, and you can go for it, and you can drop a 500-pound bomb on it. You can only do that because you've got the Dutch involved. You've got yeah. the whole, you've got some yeah. The, 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 Ameri the, yeah, the, 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 the Americans, we bring the steel, we bring the hardware, we bring the gear, yeah. but the edge, the fighting edge, is that local knowledge and that local experience to you to be able that's to cool. use that edge effectively, and that's where that the cooperation and and again, you know, the theme we we constantly talk about is the is the branching out of our appreciation of those who participate in World War II and, of course, the repercussions. I mean, that was a, my takeaway from yesterday's show on Operation Jaywick was my focus for years had been, hooray, Australian commandos back in Australia having a pint. I had kind of forgotten how many Chinese and others were impounded, tortured, mm -hmm. killed, murdered in Singapore in reprisal of that. The, that, that. That's the thing we need to be reminded of uh, as well, the impact on the civilians yes. we talk about in Europe as well. So, well, we, you know, we, we, we could go off on a tangent and talk about that. But mm -hmm. I, you, we, frankly, considering you and I put this show together, and I say <laughs> you and I, basically you, you put this together in the last... 12 hours or something it's it's i think it's been quite successful so um thank you very much for joining us jamie and again folks uh, the links to his website below his youtube channel if you want naval history and um particularly about the carrier fleet and the carrier force it's all there for you um i'll just remind people what coming up and i'll say goodbye in a second so weekend off for me again um, and then Monday, we start History Reanalyzed Week. So a variety of shows next week. We've got the Midway show, Shattered, Shattered Sword, on Monday. We're looking at Gay Servicemen in World War II with Stephen Bourne on Wednesday. We've got a look at William Stevenson, the uh, the, it, the true intrep the story of intrepid, uh, the, the spy master. Um, all sorts of stuff coming up next week where we're, as, I, as the, the clue is in the title, we are reanalyzing histories. I'm looking forward to that. And then things go on in August. August, much of August is kind of random shows, essentially, because I'm fitting in all the people that I've been trying to kind of squeeze into a theme with that don't kind of fit in. So Hedy Lamar, we're doing a show about Hedy Lamar and Bluetooth and, and torpedoes. A whole raft of things coming in of August, end of se September, Battle of Britain week, Arnhem week. Oh, it gets more kind of set in set around a particular uh, campaign in september so i'm so excited about what we got coming up in the rest of this month and in august and again thank you to all you for sticking with me thank you for the historians who keep willing willing willingly coming forward to participate with me because it would be really ridiculous me talking to on my own every single time uh so thank you very much jamie for joining us um I, it's, it's really kind of beer beer and bed for you fairly soon isn't it yeah uh, yes it is indeed yep nine o'clock here 
Well, thank you very much, everybody, again, for watching. Thank you, Jamie. Again, links to his website, links to his YouTube channel are in the description below. This is Paul Woodard, and uh, I'm thanking everybody for watching again. I will see you on, all on World War II TV on Monday. Thank you very much. Enjoy your weekend.